Welcome to Tech Talk number four. In the last three Tech Talks, we've looked at resonances, um, well, not specifically resonances, we've looked at holes in the frequency response or peaks in the frequency response, which may or may not be related to resonances. Um, I thought we'd take this a little bit further. Uh, Harwood wrote in the early 70s of a colleague who had developed a loudspeaker in his former employer where, this is our frequency versus um, decibels chart, where the loudspeaker had a frequency response that looked like, in one instance it looked like this, and as Harwood says, in his second employment, this same engineer managed to smooth out the response. So this was his first attempt and this was his second attempt. And considering the discussions that we've had in the previous tech talks, one would hope, uh, but it can't be assumed, that by flattening out these issues here, as he did with his later development, that this one would sound um, necessarily better. Actually, Harwood says that the shocking reality was this sounded considerably worse than this one. And the reason he attributed to that was, upon listening, that in this region here, around 500 hertz, which was the problem region, although the frequency response was now flat, there was, as he describes, horrendous coloration. So what is coloration? I remember saying to Dudley Harwood in one of our meetings, um, Dudley, what exactly does this word coloration mean? And he thought about it for a few seconds and then in his sage-like way said, you'll know it when you hear it, which was not much of an answer, but he was right. It was a very um, intellectual concept that required uh, more experience on my part to actually make sense of this. So I'm going to try and boil that down, uh, a, a sort of introduction to coloration in, the, uh, in, the, in this video. Now, if we, if we consider the factors that would lead to the judgment of a loudspeaker, we've already said that the frequency response flatness may or may not be a, an, a, an absolute arbiter of the uh, perceived performance of a loud, it's loudspeaker. Uh, ob objectively, it's certainly a great thing to aim for and one that I've aimed for, but it doesn't necessarily translate to a subjective performance. So what are we left with? Well, what we're really left with is the transient performance, which is another word for saying the dynamic performance of the loudspeaker. In other words, how it behaves with a real-world music signal or an, imp an impulsive signal which is more convenient to use in the laboratory. And um, Harwood's predecessor, Shorter, at the BBC back in the late 30s or early 40s, I believe, identified that there was a, 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 um, a p potential explanation for coloration in the... Um, in looking at the frequency response of a loudspeaker fractions of a second after the impulse had ceased. So if, for example, we were to take a drive unit like this, um, a Harbeth drive unit, and we were to connect a battery uh, across the input terminals, which would cause the cone to jump, um, we are shocking the mechanical, electromechanical system into action, and that might tell us if we had a microphone facing this excited transducer, that might give us some clues as to what's going on because these systems are conceptually very simple. A magnet, a voice coil, uh, a spider, a surround and a cone. But actually the interaction, the mechanical interaction between these parts is extremely complicated. So what was discovered by Shorter way back was that if you took a, uh, a sine tone like that, and you truncated it as it passed through the zero point, and you connected that to your loudspeaker unit, 
If you put a microphone in front of the loudspeaker to measure its output here, you would find two things. First of all, that the loudspeaker took a little time to build up to the peak energy of the input signal. Then it would hold it for a period. And then at this point here where the signal ceases, the electrical input ceases, the loudspeaker, whoops, the loudspeaker would continue radiating sound beyond the point that the electrical signal has ceased. And by varying the frequency and um, uh, 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 taking measurements across the audio band, you will find that loudspeakers, um, in some cases, abrupt, uh, 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 cease quite abruptly. So you might get that, which is perfect. At other frequencies, um, the thing rings on for a long time. And um, even quite closely related frequencies, just a few hertz or tens of hertz apart, you might have one of them which rings on and one of them that stops abruptly. So the suggestion was that if resonances are buried resonances, buried resonances uh, in the drive unit, if they are closely packed, um, and the note in the music hits one, it may well excite the adjacent resonances into, into um, life, and they all start radiating. And this could produce a blurring of sound or a fogging of sound or um, a loss of resolution. So, back in the 1960s, when the LS series, the three-way LS55 was being developed, Harwood noted that... Um, on completion of the loudspeaker prototype, listening tests showed a marked coloration in the 1500 hertz region, even though the middle frequency unit had passed our usual tests. It appeared to be coloration free in the lab on steady tones. Still more careful measurement with chopped tone, which is what this is, revealed that there were three resonances close together in frequency, which had a dilution of about 40 decibels. In other words, they were well below the, um, the signal level. So what he was saying was, if we now turn this into a frequency response chart, what he was saying was that, oops, back to our old friend, hertz and decibels, the steady state response at time zero of our loudspeaker looks like that. So that's time zero. But if we measure the response of the loudspeaker a fraction of a second later, a perfect loudspeaker, we would expect to have just a quieter output. So this is loud and this is silence in fact here. And another fraction of a second later, it would have dropped in loudness even further until a period of time later there would be complete silence from the loudspeaker across the audio band but it doesn't unfortunately work like that because what actually happens is that a fraction of a second later say a hundredth of a second later or so this has indeed decayed but there are some frequencies which have not decayed as much Another fraction of a second later, these might become even more pronounced as they start to stand out from the background level. And possibly quite a significant fraction of a second, we have uh, these resonances quite clearly defined. Now, if they were, he is saying if they were very close to each other, if there's a note in the music which stimulates one, it might well set the adjacent ones into, into, uh, into resonance. So what does a resonance actually sound like? Well, I can synthesize that quite easily with this um, empty bottle. If I hit the right note, the right puff, and if you listen very carefully, it goes back to our, um, our sine wave, whereby it takes a little time to build up to the... It's probably a bit low. If, it, uh, if, if my puff takes a little time to build up the resonance and then when I cease blowing, 
it takes a while to decay like so probably the best part of half a second in this decay area here but if I was to damp the resonance with a piece of loudspeaker grill cloth by putting it across the top no matter how hard I blow I can't set that into resonance because it's been damped and what Harwood found was that if they took the loudspeaker cone of the day, which was this Beckstring cone, which I weighed had an undoped weight of 5.5 grams, if you take a bottle of basically PVA wood glue and a brush and you dip the brush into the glue and you apply it to the surface of the cone, possibly on the front and the back. This is what they did and still do. So we apply that front and back as we build up the damping layer. It ameliorates these resonances so that they're not as pronounced, so that they're still there, but maybe they, they're treated like that. But there's a serious problem with this. The undoped um, weight of this cone was 5.5 grams. By adding the dope, we're up to 9 grams, which is, what, 60% more or so, which means for the same electrical input compared to um, a unit that has no, like a radial unit, which has no surface treatment at all, uh, the efficiency of this is very, very low. And this is one of the reasons why the BBC speakers as a class had very low efficiency because there was so much dope required to be painted onto the cones to treat latent uh, coloration issues, latent resonance issues, that the, um, the amount of electrical power in for an acoustic output was really very low. And not only that, it, um, it doesn't look great. So here is an example of a 60s base unit which is um, extensively uh, doped and you can see you can see um, the surface finish on that uh, and you can see the brush strokes quite clearly whereas uh, a unit like the radial one which is injection molded of the and, and uses the right plastic compound which deals with these issues of uh, latent uh, resonances requires no surface treatment at all so it's more efficient and it obviously looks better and you can tell it's injection molded by the shiny surface. So that's another insight into uh, issues in the frequency response which are not always in the static response but are sometimes hidden, masked in the dynamic response of the loudspeaker. I forgot to show you this. This um, cone that we doped earlier with uh, PVA uh, wood glue which in its day was called Plastiflex 1200, but it was basically wood glue, um, provides only a surface treatment. So if I was to actually get to the... I can actually peel off the doping layer. So that's it. That is PVA wood glue which is quite rubbery actually and that's why it damps but it's only sitting there on the surface and as you can see from this 1960s unit uh, it wants to shrink and pull away from the surround so from an engineering point of view this is an absolute bodge because what you really want is to manufacture or to engineer I should say into the cone itself the appropriate level of damping so that you don't have to put PVA dope sitting unsecured on the surface of the cone.